this is the next section um, on uh, some Wi-Fi and BLE uh, uh, things that uh, that we see happening uh, in in the marketplace right now. Um, so I want to spend just a little bit of time talking about Wi-Fi 6E. Um, I know Francois was asking if we're going to announce a 6E AP today. Uh, sorry to disappoint, we are not announcing a 6E AP. Um, however, I did want to go through um, some of the just how we see six gigahertz and and some of the things that we're thinking about um, so that you can also think about them. Um, so first up uh, is is the regulatory perspective, um, and so the, the the first question is, does your country support six gigahertz? Um, uh, the Wi-Fi Alliance has a fantastic resource out there um, if you search for it on their web page on their on their website um, around which countries are actually uh, considering adopting um, uh, or have adopted um, uh, six gigahertz. You know, allowing unlicensed, unlicensed uh, in six gigahertz, um, as well as how much spectrum uh, they're actually allocating. So uh, typically countries that are considering six gigahertz, and there's a number of them now, um, are either in that 500 megahertz or 1200 megahertz. Uh, and so, you know, Europe, 500 megahertz, US and most of the North American and South American countries, uh, 1200 megahertz. And so, uh, you know, this that's kind of, you know, something to keep in the back of your mind, right? It's um, and, and so as we go through um, regulatory certification, this is the first time that we're going to be certifying for six gigahertz. Um, and so we're not quite sure what kind of roadblocks we're going to run into, um, but it's going to be the first time for everybody kind of expect, um, you know, I've, most vendors release into the FCC or US domain first, um, uh, and then kind of, uh, you know, into Europe and the rest of the world um, works, you know, just kind of expect it may take a little bit longer for those, um, you know, for other countries as we go through the certification process for the first time. Um, the other thing around regulatory is, you know, there's kind of three classifications, two or three classifications of, of um, uh, you know, whether it's very low power, low power or kind of standard power. Um, and so most countries are adopting this low power indoor type of um, mindset where you're allowed to deploy Wi-Fi 6E uh, or you know, 6 gigahertz unlicensed indoors um, without a lot of you know, restrictions. There's some transfer power restrictions, but you, know, you have broad, you know, um, broad use of the channels and, and all, you know, uh, all channels are allowed. Um, and this, is kind of, this also applies to the client side. So we think that most clients are going to certify as low power indoor. Um, there's the standard power mode, which allows you the use of external antennas, um, and a client can certify as dual, uh, as a dual capable client. And we think that's going to be a little bit less common, but we'll see. We think it's um, so. We're actually not quite sure how things are going to pan out, especially with out, you know, outdoor Wi-Fi and and six gigahertz. Um, so this is just kind of a consideration. Um, you know, if, if you're somebody who relies heavily upon external antennas, um, outdoor Wi-Fi, uh, and are looking to move to six gigahertz, um, this is just something to keep in mind around. It's this is something that we still need to figure out, right? So standard power, um, at least um, in the FCC domain, uh, is something that will be governed by a, a, a frequency coordination service, such as similar to a SAS. Um, in CBRS land, um, and that has not yet been finalized. Um, we think by the end of the year, the rules will be finalized, and by early next year, there will be some commercial offerings around uh, AFC, but you know, also an unknown. Um, from the client perspective, you know, there's there's a handful of clients out there, um, but you know, the client ecosystem is still, you know, still not great. That will change. Um, we think it's going to be a number of years, you know, two, three, four years before we have majority six gigahertz adoption. Um, you know, we're, we're three years into Wi-Fi six and we still only have 20% adoption. Um, so, you know, presumably this is a new frequency band. We may see a little quicker adoption, but, you know, clients are still going to be an unknown um, as well as, um, you know, so what, what does that mean? Well, it means that five gigahertz remains your primary access medium. Um, so don't forget about your five gig um, as you're deploying six gigahertz because you need to rely upon that five gig and even 2.4, right? We haven't been able to totally get rid of 2.4. Um, it still has a lot of use. Um, uh, and so, you know, things like dual five gigahertz are certainly relevant in a six gig world. Um, and then lastly, um, you know, around design is, you know, is your design going to have to change? Um, we think in majority of circumstances indoors, right? In that kind of office 
um, environment? Probably no. You're not going to have a design change um, from a you know if you have higher power cells, right? You you rely upon you know maximum power from your APs. Uh, you're probably going to have to do a design change. And outdoor, we think you know with the AFC, um, you know there's going to be some considerations there as well. Um, so yeah, this is this is kind of how we're thinking about six gigahertz. Um, you know, I, I just you know throughout a lot of things i apologize for that but uh, um you know this is just what's going through our mind right now from a from a six gigahertz perspective and and Wes, if i could just add one more thing to this right so most vendors that jumped the gun on wi-fi six their first gen aps didn't last very long uh, um, uh, for a variety of reasons uh, for us when we launched the ap43 to this day it is our flagship ap for wi-fi six and we don't have any throwaway APs on our portfolio. Um, so we're going into this uh, uh, very, very sort of carefully, meticulously, and you'll see an announcement from us uh, soon enough. But, uh, uh, you know, I just want to caution that as, as, as Wes said, uh, I think uh, five gig will be here for a long time. You, you can't buy a six gig AP with a, a two by two five gig radio, right? Just makes no sense. Uh, you're designing backwards. So, so we're going to go into this uh, um, uh, guns blazing uh, uh, with, with the right AP uh, uh, soon. So that's, that's as much as we are allowed to tell you today. <laughs> so yeah. I'll shut up there. All right, I, I think that's good enough for me. I'll, I'll hand it over to uh, Sunalini to talk about some, uh, some location items. Thank you, Wes, and, and thank you, everybody. So I'm going to talk about location a little bit as it ties back to the network and everything that not only we are doing from a product perspective, but how our customers are actually using this. Location is becoming relevant in Every vertical now, I'm seeing more and more requests come in from customers across enterprise, education, healthcare, retail, you name it, there's a location use case that's waiting to happen. It's no longer the, the key point is it's no longer the are the possible. It's actually being used in real time, impacting business outcomes. That business outcome could be safety related, especially with the pandemic and now the workplace is opening up or that business outcome could be all about customer loyalty in retail or managing congestion hotspots at events. I saw a Twitter feed around, hey, how will MIST do in events? Well, not only does the MIST AI work for events, even location works very well for events. So let's go a little bit into what is this all about? You should all be very familiar with this. We've been presenting this since MIST was born, but truly the key point here is that MIST continues to be differentiated with the platform that we have. It's a platform that enables multiple use cases and with the virtual BLE technology, it is differentiation that our customers are using every day. More than half of our customer population is consuming location services, whether it's from a network IT perspective with looking at location for connected Wi-Fi devices, feeding that into what you saw earlier from Jacob and Wes around the coverage hole as well as the roaming SLE interactions and how we're able to pinpoint exactly where the issues are on a floor plan, or even from an analytics perspective around occupancy and the enterprise, especially the safe enterprise or retail analytics around dwell time at checkout areas or departments. But it all hinges back to, it's the same platform, it's the same access point, it's the same simple architecture. You deploy the APs in the ceiling, which have this directional Bluetooth antenna array built in, you have the MIST cloud enabling all this visibility and insights. And I also talk about how even in location, we actually deliver actionable outcomes for our end users. So this is a live network. Um, this is our Juniper facility in Sunnyvale. We have obviously the entire Juniper network as Sudhir spoke to you about discovered by wired wireless WAN powered by MIST AI. But in addition to what we are doing for the network, even from an security, environmental compliance perspective, the MIST platform is coming into use. We, as Juniper employees, all have Bluetooth badges that we enter a facility, and that is being used as we speak for occupancy analytics. So what you're seeing right now is a real-time view of a Juniper building, certain floors where certain areas are non-compliant. Now, you may say, it's great that you're telling me I have a congestion hotspot there. I have 50% occupancy now as part of my phase three of going back to work at Juniper. But that's great. It's a view on a, on a floor plan. What do I do with it? 
And that is where we make it actionable, right? The key difference is not only are we able to show you exactly where the hotspots are if you're looking at the UI, but we don't expect the security team to be looking at a UI to see, oh, I have congestion now, or I have certain areas that are out of compliance. Where we take it a step further is actually notify the security team or the HR teams if a certain area on your floor plan on a site or across multiple sites goes on multiple sites goes out of compliance so that the security team can take action and disperse the crowds in a conference room, in a desk area, in a break room area, if they're violating the occupancy compliance rules. So that again is, it's not data for data's sake. It's not just pretty pictures around heat map. Everybody does that. Where we take it to the next step is again, leveraging unsupervised machine learning to give you the best location accuracy possible with virtual BLE. And more importantly, making it actionable so that the right teams can take action at the right time when a certain area goes out of compliance. Now, the next aspect of this also is, apart from the monitoring and the real-time alerting, is the ability to look at compliance reporting, right? So if you speak to the, the security line of business in any, any enterprise vertical, not only do they have to take action when things are happening in real time, when a certain area goes out of compliance, they also need to prove that they are actually maintaining compliance at all times. And that is where, again, with the location analytics, leveraging Bluetooth and Wi-Fi, with what we have done, where the Juniper security teams are actually using our compliance reporting to show which areas they are able to maintain compliance throughout the last seven days, the last two weeks, the last month, and which areas are actually continual offenders where they need to enforce stricter policy. So whether it's real-time action, whether it's compliance trending and reporting, the MIS platform is meeting those use cases, not only just for network IT, but also more importantly for line of business in this case being the facilities team, the security teams. Yes, how, uh, how flexible is what you're showing us here? Is it just this you know, one or two use cases based on only these metrics or can we kind of play with it a little bit uh, for any data that was generated in those areas? Absolutely, the, the key part is customization, but the key part also is making that customization or data inside actionable. But this is extremely flexible. You can look at the data and carve it and, and slice and dice it in any different way that you want. So say, yeah. so say I wanted a, a sensor set out to tell me if I saw anyone at neg 80 or above because I have a lab I'm wanting to maintain compliance in. Could I do that? You could. Yeah, yeah. And that is where uh, a feature called proximity zones also comes in where you can set an R side threshold. And I'm not showing it here today. I probably should have. But we have this uh, new capability called proximity zones where exactly to your point, you could actually set an RSI threshold. And if that RSI threshold gets crossed, you'll get an, an automated web book alert saying we are seeing a device in that area. Thank you. This is, this is one slice landing uh, um, of a very customizable dashboard, absolutely. So moving on to the next slide, I spoke about how we are using this at Juniper, how this is coming up in every conversation we're having in the enterprise vertical with multiple customers. But now let me take you back to retail, right? Again, when location and especially Bluetooth technology began about almost seven years ago, the buzz was all around push notifications. Uh, but where the real use case came about was customers using data from Wi-Fi, from Bluetooth to solve clear business outcomes. In this case, this is a top 10 retailer that who is our customer, they have deployed MIST across the chain. And their key question was, hey, I have you know, a scanning in initiative where customers or shoppers can come into the store, scan a product and check out right there via the mobile app. I have scanning checkout stations in certain areas. I have manned checkout stations and I have checkout stations near my grocery section as well. I want to see for a, their business problem that they were trying to solve and get visibility on was, I want to see first of all, which checkout station is being used the most. Is my mobile app the number one checkout way so that I can do line busting much faster? And in that scenario as well, what is the average shopping trip time and how much of that shopping trip is spent on the checkout area? They use the MIST data, they created uh, the department level visibility on the, on the floor plans, they imported the MIST portal and then the MIST portal did all the work using location technology. And very easily they were able to get to this view of, hey, my average shopping trip time seems to be 50 minutes for majority of my shopping visits. And more importantly, of that 50 minutes, it looks like 33% of that time was spent at the checkout center. 
So if the question on the table is, is are my line busting initiatives effective? Am I able to decrease that timeline? As you can see, they're definitely going after that problem, making more and more checkout lanes available. But the way to answer that question or the way to even see if they need to change how they do checkouts is all being powered by the, the data, the location analytics powered by Mist AI. And that is the end of uh, the location presentation, how the location aspect built into your Mist AI network solves more problems for the line of business as well, be it enterprise or be it retail.